Good evening again, everybody. I'm Tom Cook, film professor here at Keene State College. And this is our uh, career development in film and media class. Uh, those of you who have been joining us throughout the semester uh, have been entertained by many of our guests. This class is designed for primarily juniors and seniors in their preparations for graduating and, knock wood, hopefully finding work once they graduate. We do exercises that are about uh, doing interviews, working on the elevator pitch. For those of you in the biz who know what that is, they work on their resumes, on demo reels, on websites, and uh, ultimately the entire course is designed around helping them for one of a better term and in truth, sell themselves when they get out and graduate. Uh, one of my favorite aspects of this class, and I think uh, one of the most entertaining for the class and hopefully for you folks who are tuning in to listen to us, is uh, every week we have guests who either work in the industry or are graduates of ours or both. And this week, I'm uh, very pleased to close out the semester with a good friend of mine for many, many years and a former colleague on the uh, Cheshire TV, local Cheshire TV, for those of you who are watching us from uh, Keene, New Hampshire, or anywhere else that would that uh, Cheshire TV might be streaming, and uh, my good buddy Lee Perkins. Lee, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thrilled to be here and happy to see you again. Great. Um, you and I were uh, did a movie show, a movie review show for, golly, years and years and years, as I recall. Yeah. Um, and that got us out and uh, uh, to be able to see some things. Uh, now, what exactly, and, and again, I was on the board of directors for Cheshire TV uh, for most of the time that it was uh, formed. Uh, and strangely enough, as I'm preparing for this final class of ours right now, I realized that I'm sure when I first accepted the board chair at Cheshire TV, I read into your resume and knew your background. I know you have extensive uh, television production background. You and I have a very similar approach to production, but um, tell us about what you did beforehand and how you got into the uh, television and or production industry. Sure, um, I'm happy to explain that. Um, like most people who find their way into this industry or, or business, I've been I had been interested in it since I was a little kid, um, the, uh, the, the very first uh, time that I ever realized that it was a thing that a person could do to make a living um, was at a uh, drive-in double feature of The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker. And I just mm -hmm. was knocked out by, by those movies. And um, <clears throat> from that point forward, all I was interested in was was filmmaking and then that sort of morphed into other stuff. So, you know, when I was 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 and 16, pretty much all the way up until I graduated from high school, uh, whatever other kids were doing, everything I did was focused on, you know, making a movie. Um, <laughs> terrible, terrible, terrible movies. Uh, and, and, you know, this is long enough ago that it was pre- uh, flying erase head and affordable video production gear. So we're talking eight millimeter and super eight film. Uh, so, you know, like my first job was working at a restaurant, busing tables to make money to buy 50 foot rolls of film <laughs> and paying to get them developed. That was my focus for everything. Everything I did was about, you know, uh, making the movies. So um, <clears throat> when I was finished with that, I, um, Oddly enough, I did not uh, did not score grades good enough to go to college because I spent all my time making movies instead <laughs> of uh, doing uh, schoolwork. So I ended up going into the service and I did some photography and, uh, and a little bit of radio when I was in the service. And when I got out, um, I, I basically did everything I could possibly do to get an opportunity to touch a camera or a microphone or a light or anything. And... Um, although this is not necessarily like how I would recommend anybody start their career. The reason I want to talk about it is uh, to point out that at the time I would never have thought that it would have led to anything. It was just the closest I could get at that moment. And I had a really good friend that was one of those guys I made movies with when I was a kid um, who worked at a small mom and pop production house that did lots of consumer and small business videos. Um, 
and he wanted to break off and do his own thing. So he needed to replace himself to, to smooth his exit. And he called me out of the blue one day and said, would you like to have my job? And I said, oh, yes, please. Um, so uh, that's good. That, that really sounds like small potatoes. But I can I, I can tell you that you and I have known each other for a long time. You've, you've seen how I work and you've seen my approach to things. All of that, almost all of that was shaped in that first job. Um, that's when I learned the language of, of storytelling and the language of filmmaking. That's where I learned what an incredibly indescribably powerful emotional manipulator this medium can be. Um, I used to tell people uh, who didn't understand what I did that I made people cry for a living um, because I would take, uh, people would come in and say, you know, here's boxes and boxes of, of, of pictures and videos from, from my family. And I would make 50th anniversary videos that would bring 400 people into a ballroom to tears, um, which is corny and small, but to me, the 400 people in that ballroom is the equivalent of a nationwide audience. Yeah. Because if you can, if you can reach out and push those buttons, and if you can make people laugh on cue when you want them to, and cry on cue when you want them to, you're you're in complete control of that audience. And um, it's it was pretty pretty fun and and pretty amazing. And uh, I pushed really hard in that little mom and pop shop to do more commercial stuff because I, after a while, I wanted to do something that was, that was less consumer related and more commercial. And that allowed me to make a much bigger leap to a much larger, you know, to, from this little mom and pop shop to um, the premier production company in the entire Midwest that did um, infomercials, uh, the client's the only reason I'm going to list off some of the clients is so you understand the scope of this organization's client base, not, you know, name dropping, but this was a commercial facility and their clients, they were, they, they did all the work for Victoria's Secret, the, the entire limited brand catalog. Pretty much if you walk through a shopping center in the early nineties, every store you walk past belonged to this organization as far as the media production. And it wasn't just like commercials. It was all their internal stuff. Um, for every 30 second spot you see on television, there's an hour worth of internal content mm. that nobody ever sees. Um, and that, again, that was in the early nineties. So we did, you know, lottery, live sporting events, infomercials, um, just, it was a commercial production house. And I worked for, God, five straight years, 20 hour days and was never tired. I did a ton of large scale live events, traveled all over the country doing really, really large live events. Um, and again, when it comes to like entertainment and show business, it doesn't really feel like it's the same thing. But when I got to the point when I started doing things like that, that's that's what that was my film school. You know, I learned. Uh, I learned how to do the things that, that I that I learned by having clients standing right behind me, you know, which is uh, stressful. Um, I learned how to do live television, doing live sporting events, which, you know, is, uh, is a totally different kind of pressure all by itself. Um, there's no script, you know, and you have to, you have to be predicting the future, 30 seconds into the future, and you have to have seven different options all live and, and with their, you know, uh, uh, pathways, if you make choice one, then the three choices that are opened up because of that, that sort of thing. Um, and that, that's a pressure cooker. You, you know, you don't learn a lot doing that. Um, and so after that, I, uh, I did uh, a couple of years, four or five years of, uh, of theater in new England and, um, large scale, like show business stuff like concerts. Um, Behind the scenes from, theater, not on, not on stage. Theater. No, 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 no. Were, I'm not an actor. <laughs> no, no. Okay, you were no, in high I'm school though. About, I, were you not? What's that? You were in high school, were you not? Oh yeah. Were you not I Harold did. Hill? Oh no. Uh, what kind of game are you playing here? Yeah. I was just wondering. Yeah. I thought I thought you Who were. Who did that so. research for you? Yeah, yeah. I did. Uh, I was the music. I was the music man in the music man when I was excellent. Kid. And uh, but that was really really young. But no, I I got I got the performing in front of people kind of out of my system from that. But uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, sorry. I didn't know that. 
No, how did you? I, you and I were on set you sometime, and we both started okay. singing. Right. Yeah. Something Sometimes I'll break into music from that show, and people are just right. You know, they laugh at me. Anyway, uh, so no behind the scenes, I did uh, like you know lighting and uh, and video projection right. for like very very large concerts, um, in, like the Verizon Arena in Manchester. Um, you know, share the Eagles, Boston. Britney Spears, um, you know, the, the acts that are big enough to fill that arena. And I also did stuff at the uh, Capitol Center for the Arts in Concord, which is a small theater. And uh, up at Lake Winnipesaukee, there's a, a concert venue. It's changed names a couple of times, but it's an outdoor shed. So Huey Lewis in the News and, you know, Meatloaf and mm-hmm. uh, Kenny Log or Kenny Rogers, um, you know, it's a different for, for people who, who do concerts. That's a, it's a different there's tiers, you know, there's there's the A, the B and the C. Um, you know, and they all have, they're all completely different kinds of work, um, which, you know, again, it, it's, uh, I've had a, I've had a very, very uh, diverse experience. Um, interestingly enough, filmmaking, you know, hard, cold filmmaking was not what I ended up doing with my life. But, you know, once I, once I got hooked up with the Cheshire TV, that, Turns out that was my true calling. You know, my true calling was being a, a, an absolute zealot for the First Amendment and discovering <laughs> that that this incredibly powerful communications medium, which, you know, back when when we were getting started in 2005 on that, the Internet was still getting warmed up and there wasn't a phone in everybody's pocket that had a high definition camera. So back then it was still valuable to provide these powerful communication tools to regular people who would normally never be heard. And in my mind, that would be in the category of like documentary filmmaking. You know, um, there are, there for every Ken Burns or for every, you know, uh, Michael Moore, there are a hundred smaller documentary filmmakers that, that, excuse me, that, that struggle, you know, to be heard. So um, that was, as you well know, why I gave 10 years and just a truly stupid number of hours uh, to that, because from that, I, I, the thing that I'm the most proud of, apart from obviously, you know, providing that access to, to be heard was, you know, my relationship with, with, you know, the, the high school kids, Nate Salvideo and Nick Fletcher, who have gone on to truly embarrassingly successful careers. <laughs> so um, you know, like looking back at that 12 year old kid laying on the top of a mid seventies station wagon, watching James Bond. Um, I think I, I'm happier with how it turned out than if it had gone the way I wanted it to when I was 12 <laughs> as much. And I'm, I'm 52 and I'm still t- toying with the idea of hauling myself out to LA with my wife and seeing if I can't spend the next 20 years of my life as a, as a grip or, uh, you know, uh, just, you know, whatever, um, because that would be a fun way to finish up my career. Sure. You know, playing in the movies without any need to be successful. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the background. Any immediate questions, folks? I've got some, but you mentioned, you alluded to, and I certainly know this, uh, and those who are local know of your um, support for First Amendment rights and that being a motivating factor for the very existence of our local cable company. What you you alluded to, uh, it sounded like your discovery of that or what started you on the flag wearing First Amendment uh, chip on your shoulder? <laughs> well, um, interestingly enough, when there was a uh, th- there was a transition period, I would say in the mid to late eighties into the early nineties, where film at the level that I was doing it was disappearing, and video there was a bit of a gap before video became affordable and ubiquitous. Public access stations at that time were still using cameras that started at a hundred thousand dollars. So if you wanted to shoot anything and edit, you, you could do it in, at a public access place. And that was really the only option that most people had. Um, and the idea that, that, that me and all my friends, you know, who were making these terrible movies could 
get involved with one of those organizations was really appealing because it was free. The idea that you could just go and take a class and they would let you have the equipment and you could, you know, do whatever you wanted and no one had to give you permission. And then it would just, all you had to do was agree to put it on their channel. And um, in the community where I lived, that organization was not free and welcoming to everyone. It was very clicky and they basically would quiz you before you ever got to use the equipment. And if they didn't like what you were going to do, (laughs) this would suddenly become unavailable. And there wasn't really anything that I could do about that. So I found other alternative uh, avenues. And I really would like to come back to that. So if you can make a note to bring me back to those alternative avenues. Um, So so later in my life, you know, after I had had all of this wonderful experience and learned all of these things and was looking for a way to keep on doing it and make it, I don't know, find a new way to make it exciting and interesting to me, I found myself sitting in a position where I could address that not for the me from way back when, but for the people today. And interestingly enough, that is exactly what happened when you when you first start saying out loud, hey, if you want to come in here and, you know, create content, we don't care what it is. You know, I mean, I just kept saying that over and over again, um, you know, in, in, in talking to people about what that was like, it was weird because people would come in and just naturally say, Hey, I, I think I would like to make a, a documentary or a TV show about, uh, you know, gardening. What do you think about that? And my answer was always, I think that's a great idea. Let me show you how to do that because, I wasn't, I, I wasn't allowed to say something wasn't a great idea and I wouldn't because I think they're all great ideas. So um, I didn't always have this, you know, <clears throat> this over the top attitude towards the First Amendment, but it really didn't take me very long to go from being, you know, interested in it to being a champion of it to being an absolute zealot. And I, I don't know that I want to waste a lot of time, you know, for the students like trying to figure out a clever way to connect that to what they're interested in. I think that most of them probably are pretty familiar with it. There would be no filmmaking industry if it wasn't for the First Amendment. Um, so I, I don't think I need to convince any of them how important that is to to their own future plans, you know. Or am I am I am I wrong about that? Should I make should I make a point to say be a fan of the First Amendment because without it, it doesn't really matter what you want to do. Well, I think I think it's certainly something that that we want to discuss eventually while we're here tonight uh okay. and then also um i'm not exactly sure how many of you you're all obviously familiar with motion pictures with a video but how many of you feel like you understand uh the the premise and like the origins of cable television because that was my origin with lee and lee is that not what brought you to keen or were you in keen no, um, i was in keen already okay yeah, that's not what brought me to Keen. Um, uh, and then when and when you when you say cable television, just for clarification, are you talking about like cable television or public access? Public access. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that's a fair question. Public access is not a thing that everybody is familiar with. Right. Um, so yeah, sorry. So give us Go some ahead. background then. Okay. So um, uh, yeah, I'll give you the the fastest possible background on cable television. There was a time in the olden olden days when there wasn't any such thing as cable. All there was was a handful of broadcast affiliates around the country, not a handful, hundreds, every town, every city basically had, a, you know, the three networks, ABC, CBS, and uh, NBC. And, you know, there was no Fox until the late eighties. <clears throat> and back then, you know, you could only get television if your antenna would pick it up. And most people didn't live in, in range. And uh, somewhere in Pennsylvania, some guy that owned a hill, a community in the Valley went and said to him, Hey, if we all gather our money together, and uh, put up a tower that will allow us to pull the signal in from, I don't know, Pittsburgh or Philadelphia, New York, whatever. Uh, will, will you rent us space on the top of your mountain? Will you let us rent this space on, of your land? And then we will bring a cable down the mountain and we will put this signal into everybody's house. Um, and, you know, they agreed and cable television was invented. The <laughs> idea that you could take something that is traveling across the air for free and deliver it to people that normally wouldn't be able to get it for a, a fee. And then that turned into pulling in farther away. So if you lived in New York, you could get Chicago television. I have no idea why anybody in New York would want to watch college television, but you know, that's uh sorry, I'm 
being obscured here. <laughs> so the, the origins of cable television was essentially getting something to everybody that was previously only available to some. Um, and it turned out that cable television was very popular and it took no time at all to, to get all the way across the country. And pretty quickly, local communities were saying, hey, these cable companies are utilizing public property. They're utilizing you know, things that belong to the public. What are we getting back? And so somebody cooked up the idea and it ended up going to Congress and became a law that the, the communities were allowed to require the cable company to enter into a business agreement in order to do business there. So you can't just start a cable company. You need to get permission from the, the town or the city. And part of that agreement is you have to provide some of this power to the people. You have to give some of this to the individual people. And again, God, I can't believe how much I'm saying back then, but things change. When Tom and I were young, there was something called the Fairness Doctrine in broadcasting, which basically meant that if you went on television and said something, another guy was allowed to come and say something different. Um, and uh, so oftentimes the news would have a point counterpoint. Um, and <clears throat> that idea is based upon the fact that the television stations are broadcasting on public airwaves. The government gave the broadcasters the, the right to broadcast on the public airwaves in exchange for public programming, which is how you get PBS and the news and other things. So there was a time when the people were being served by the networks. Cable was required to serve the people as well. And so that deal basically required the cable companies to provide communities with television equipment and studios and facilities so that regular people could have their own television shows. And in some cases they were good and in some cases they were bad. Lots of very famous television faces came from public access. Um, uh, gosh, of course, right off the top of my head, uh, probably the best example is for anybody who's familiar with the TV show uh, Mythbusters, um, Adam Savage, he got his start in, uh, in a little public access station in New York. Lots and lots of people, and in places like Boston and New York and Phoenix, the public access operations, their budgets and their content rival the network affiliates. If you go to Phoenix and watch their public access, you can't tell it from ABC, CBS, or NBC. It looks the same because if you know what you're doing, just like a, a filmmaker knows that you don't have to have a Chapman dolly to get a smooth dolly shot. You can get a smooth dolly shot from lots of different things, which kind of brings me back to what I was saying about that, you know, by any means necessary. Um, one of the things that I've always loved about this line of work is that every single thing about it was completely invented by somebody. It was all just, it's all guerrilla warfare. You know, uh, every, every single piece of equipment, everything was, was dreamed up for the purpose of doing the job that it does. And um, anybody that's ever like dug into a, a grip catalog, you know, and seen the 450 different ways to mount a light, you know, I mean, that's just exciting that, you know, somebody took a bicycle chain and welded it to a vice grip. And that's how you can get a nice tight grip on a telephone pole or a tree to mount a light, you know, on a post. So uh, that that's one of the things that I love about the business is that, you know, um, Regular people use duct tape, but we use gaff tape. <laughs> so, you know, I like to live in a world where there's gaff tape. There you go. Okay. Folks, questions on, um, again, I think uh, Lee's got an uh, uh, interesting venue and, and look, see into what, if we have to think about it this way, like television production may well uh, be like, but obviously he's got a lot of experience in other areas. Um you have questions for him before I keep droning on? <laughs> yep, Megan. I was just wondering, Lee, if you could talk about um, your work kind of in public television, public access, um, and your work behind the cameras with TV production. Um, I worked a little bit um, in high school, and it was kind of an incredible experience for me. So I'm wondering if you can just talk about how um, how you work behind the scenes and things like that. Okay, sure. Um, uh, the, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the production aspect of, of whatever you're creating, um, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, a, a five or six or seven camera shoot that features, you know, 
handheld cameras and a jib arm are is more complicated than you know three locked down cameras doing a two person interview in the studio. I my area of expertise comes from very large scale outside of the studio field production, large scale live events. There is something about the uh, the energy and electricity that is created by a live audience, whether it's 200 people uh, who are you know pissed off at a school board meeting or you know 7,000 people that are you know screaming at the top of their lungs you know because the Eagles are playing um, or you know uh, uh, gosh what was the la- I'm trying to think of the last name that you guys would Drake Lil Wayne. So in my head, they're, they're a joke as the Eagles are a band. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've done everything from uh, like, from, I, I have done the work where when the opening act gets off the stage and the next act comes on, I'm one of the roadies that jumps up and pulls the microphones and the guitar stands and stuff off the stage to, you know, hanging from the truss operating a spotlight to, you know, directing the, 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 the cameras that put the image magnification up on the screens. Um, it's, it's, to me, it's all the same stuff. Um, I've done filmmaking style production where you set up for shots and you have a very controlled environment, you know, the creation of commercials um, or infomercials or basically anything that is, I, I call that filmmaking even though it's not, you know, creating the traditional entertainment narrative, um, you know, uh, an infomercial is absolutely a totally made up nonsense fantasy story. And um, uh, it it is the same kind of thing. I have spent, you know, days lighting a set, but then I've also walked into a room and had 15 minutes to do an interview. Um, And they all have their own unique challenges. And one of the things that I loved about doing the public access stuff is, is sharing these secrets, these magic tricks with people that are not already well-versed. I mean, nowadays, the average person is probably a lot more media savvy than they were 30 or 40 years ago. Um, you know, mm-hmm. but, but I mean, you know, not everybody is, is, is going to know how to hold a camera and shoot and edit and everything. But um I think that that I think what I want to point out here is that um, everything that I've ever done has been connected to other stuff that I've done. I have been able to do things professionally that were well beyond my reach because I was able to translate a smaller scale thing. Um, one of the first things that Cheshire TV did, I want, I want to give you this example. One of the first things that Cheshire TV did when we first launched was we hosted a debate between two state senator candidates in the building that our studio was in. Um, and we had to string cables down you know, from one end of the building. So it was a very large scale live event. There was a live audience. It was the very first time anything like that had ever been done in Keene. So it was historic. Um, there were a lot of people in that room. There were a lot of local movers and shakers. There were a lot of people in that room to impress. Um, The audience wasn't big, but it was a heavy audience. Um, And it was also a big deal because this was a, you know, a pretty epic battle between a, a, an incumbent Republican and a, and a challenging Democrat. And, and for those of you who maybe aren't from the area, uh, you guys may or may not know of Molly Kelly. And um, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of, behind the scenes back and forth about, you know, uh, everybody was kind of, they were jostling to decide who was going to stand on which side of the stage. And, you know, and uh, uh, there was, uh, there was, I'm not going to say the, the, who the Republican guy was, but he went to a lot of trouble to try to put Molly off of her game and, you know, was refusing essentially to, uh, to, he was trying to change the rules five minutes before he went live. And I took him off to one side into a small room that we were using as a green room. And I closed the door and I said, look, I said, you know, I understand that there are a lot of people in the community with, with a lot of power with your name, but this is my television show. We're five minutes away from going live on my show. So if you don't play nice, it'll be Molly Kelly talking to the camera lens for one hour all by herself. That's a tremendous amount of power. 
not my power, but Molly's power. And I said, you can either play nice and get half the attention, or you can not play at all and get none of the attention. And I was only able to do that because throughout my career, I have had to explain to uh, rock stars who are having a temper tantrum that yeah, they'll absolutely get their bottle of Cristal and their pepperoni pizza after the performance, you know, and there have been times in my life where I have had to do things that that were not in my job description. Um, I've had to do things that were not, that I was not qualified to do. And as I have been thinking about having this conversation, I have always enjoyed talking about the experiences that I've had in my professional life with people who are younger, because what I'm trying to impart to them, and I don't always do a great job, but what I'm trying to impart to them is that a lot of it is, boy, I don't know how to put this without, I, I want to make sure I get this right the first time. Um, it, it's a combination of, uh, of, of, of being a con artist and a magic ma magician, um, because there isn't really a way for you to tell another person professionally, I know what I'm doing, you can trust me, but you can show them. And it, over and over and over in my life, I have, I have seen that if you, if you have confidence in yourself and you, and you can figure out or you know what you're doing, um, I don't recommend lying to people, but um, if someone says, you know, can you operate a boom, you say, yes, I can. And then you hold the thing up like this and you point at the people talking and nine times out of 10, you're going to do a good job. And, uh, and, and every job that I ever got was because of the job I had before. So um, all of the things that I've, th I, I ran a public access station and I let people do these little unimportant local shows because I was able to stand in places where I had no earthly business standing. And uh, there's got to be, maybe Tom can help me out. There's got to be a word for that, you know, where you, you, your reach exceeds your grasp, but you succeed. And, and this is the only life. You cannot be a paralegal and pretend to be a lawyer, but you can be a, a lighting guy and pretend to be a first assistant camera and get away with it because there's not a badge or a patch that you get. Um, you know, am I, am I communicating this effectively, Tom, or can yeah. you maybe help me narrow it in? Okay. Well, I think um, in, in getting – I think specifics help them to understand, uh, like you say, when um, Amy wants to be a cinematographer. Well, when – if you get out of here, you're not going to have your cinematography merit badge. You're going to have a bachelor's, and who's to say what it is? I think, as Lee is saying, it's – when you get the job, you prove that you can do the work, and that's what keeps you going. Their question, obviously, and if you knew the answer, you'd write a million-dollar book, Lee, is how do you get that first job? Right, right, right. So I'll tell you, uh, it's relationships. It's, there you go. Um, it, is, uh, it is being willing. Uh, and, and you know what? This may be bad advice because I know the world changes, but um, the, the, most, the most lucrative job you can get is being someone's gopher, getting someone's damn coffee. Because the difference between you getting someone's coffee and a person who's on the other side of the barricade watching you make a movie is you're on that side of the barricade and nothing happens on the outside of the barricade. It happens on the inside. And everything that I have ever gotten from someone else of, re of real value is because they stepped beyond. Now, uh, you know, I haven't had a, people work for me who were so eager that they were in my way. And oftentimes <laughs> I will say, back off, <laughs> you know, you're not going to get my job, but um, if you do a good job, I, I will tell you that, that as cutthroat a business as this is, everybody wants two things. People who show up on time and on time is late, by the way. Um, and people who will say yes, you know, if, if somebody asks you to pick up an Apple box and move it from one place to another, there's no earthly reason not to. And in the beginning, you doing things that are beneath you is how you demonstrate, man, I really hope I'm not going out on a limb here, Tom. It's how you demonstrate a level of humility that people don't typically have after their five years of success. So in the beginning, you have to be this bizarre combination of arrogant 
and humble. You have to be cocky enough that you can convince people that you can do what they need done, but humble enough that you don't believe that you're that cocky. Um, boy, this you, is really hard, hard to explain. I've been doing it my whole life. I don't know how to explain it. Um, you say a, yes with confidence, but not arrogance. It's exactly what um, one of our previous guests, Josh Blank, who was uh, one of my former students, and he's been working for decades uh, out in Hollywood, says the exact same thing. And that, uh, uh, and what one of the reasons I enjoy, and maybe it's maybe that's why I pick people like uh, you and Josh. But you say the same things that I believe in, and I try to tell all these folks. But I think hopefully they'll listen to it when they hear it from different people. Are you Bill, guys not listening to Tom because he's the teacher? Come that's on. That's it. That's it. Bill said <laughs> much of the same things. You know, it's it's nice to just have different people saying it. And yeah, hearing yeah. It. It's um, it's uh, I, yeah, it's it's really hard because because of my because of the the work I've always done, I have a tendency to try to talk in sound bites, and you know, I'm accustomed to having a limited amount of time. So when I ramble, you know, I I kind of get lost. I mean, you know, we did it. <laughs> We did a Tom and I did a television show where we had, you know, five minutes to talk about a movie or whatever. And and, uh, you know, I was always if it were me, we would always be over time. We would always be late. But, uh, um, it, you know, like <clears throat> that, it, I mean, Tom, really, you, you hit the nail on the head when you say it's how do you get that first job? You're not going to know it's the first job when you get it. Um, the, the first time that you are noticed by someone you're going to think that what you're doing is pointless and meaningless and is getting you nowhere and doing nothing for you. And, uh, you know, I mean, everybody who works in this business is a freelancer. You're all self-employed and no one who shows up and is willing to work ever starves to death. You know, um, I, I will say I was talking to Tom and, and Mark, you know, before everybody showed up, uh, you know, I was so on time, I was half an hour early. Um, and I was saying that this is the only industry that I'm aware of that has more work than people to do it. Um, there is such a staggering amount of content being created. And we don't even have a distinction anymore between filmmaking and television production. Because I don't know about you guys, but some of the television that I'm watching these days beats the hell out of any filmmaking anybody's doing. I mean, we are not watching TV shows. We are watching cinema quality content and it's on Netflix, which, you know, people used to laugh about Netflix. Netflix was to back then what Blockbuster is today. It was a joke. And, you know, now Amazon, a company that sells books is it's creating original content. That's what I'm saying. There is so much work that if a person isn't making a living in this business, it's because they don't want to, you know, um, that's just all there is to it. And uh, I mean, there are certainly things you have to be able to do, but um, for anybody, not that anybody's asking me this question, but I'm going to volunteer it anyway, like everybody else's dad, I'll give you a nickel's worth of free advice for free. Um, if you want to be a director, that's awesome. You're going to be a director someday. Don't get too wrapped up in what you're directing, though. Um, I have found myself doing things. I have, <clears throat> I have ridden a horse backwards not the horse going backwards, but me facing backwards on the horse with a steady cam in order to shoot a commercial production. Um, something that I never in a million years thought I would do. I have stood in the back of rusted out, falling apart pickup trucks, using my considerable weight to hold down a tripod because you know when a tripod is in the back of a pickup truck and it bounces, gravity is still a thing. Um, I have hung outside of aircraft that are tipped over on their wing in order to get the shot. I have begged and pleaded and cajoled and threatened the pilot to drop below the 500 feet that he is by law supposed to stay above in order to get the shot. And none of those things ever felt like I was in the business. So all of my individual things, I always feel like this is just this incredibly cool thing that some idiot is paying me to do for fun. And that is all of those things strung together has been my entire professional life. So, um, uh, at the very, very beginning, I can tell you that the single most important thing that I've done is been there before everybody else got there. You feel like an idiot sitting in your car all by yourself in the parking lot. But when someone needs something done, they're going to ask the guy who's there, not the guy who's waiting in traffic to get there. Um, and uh, there's just something about 
the dedication of people who I used to wake up and come into work before my shirt was tucked in. I was so excited to get to work, you know, like um, that, that, you know, that, that level of dedication. And, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm 52 years old and I'm, I'm hardly even working and I'm still all excited just talking about it. You know, I still work as a freelancer four or five times a year. I get a call from a friend of mine and he says, you know, I need someone to direct, uh, you know, can you spend a week in New Orleans, you know, to direct this live event? I mean, nothing's going on right now because of COVID, but, you know, I had stuff booked and um, I still get excited. I mean, this is stuff I've done a thousand times before, but I still get excited. And, uh, and that, I mean, you know, that sense of excitement that don't ever let go of that. If you find it going away, you need to figure out a slightly different way to earn a living because while you might love shooting, you might find that you don't like the hours and you'd rather edit because, you know, they don't work long hours. Um, you know, there's lots and lots of different ways to earn a living in this business. That's another thing that I didn't really understand until I had been doing it for a while that, you know, um, some of the happiest people I've ever met in my life are prop masters and set decorators and set builders, you know, greensmen, people who provide the plants to a set, you know, I mean, that's a way people make a living. They, they bring plants out of a van and sprinkle them around the set. So uh, there's just, you know, there's just no end to what people can do in this line of work. Anybody else waiting for me to shut up so they can ask a question? Folks, ask away. Amy, you look like you're, yep, Dylan, go ahead. Yeah, um, you mentioned you did a movie review show. <clears throat> what was that like? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. Um, I loved movies until Tom ruined my life and said, yeah. let's do a show where we review seven to 10 movies a week. And it's one thing to, I mean, I used to love watching movies and after a while having to watch them yeah. being required to watch them took a lot of the fun out of it. Um, and, and it turns out that the problem is not that reviewing movies is unpleasant, that, that there's a lot of crap being created and, you know, Tom will. Oh, hang on, Lee. We lost you. You're muted. Unmute. There you How's go. That? Am I back? Sorry about You're that. You're back. I was trying to change who I was looking at. I got tired of looking at Tom. I and you were... at other people. <laughs> and I muted myself by accident. Um, sorry, what was the last thing you heard me say? You were blaming me for something. I don't remember what. So. Oh, yeah. Tom ruined Tom ruined movies for me because he said, let's do a movie review show. I used to love watching movies and having to watch them to do a TV show every week. All of a sudden, I wasn't enjoying watching them. And it turns out it's not because uh, I didn't like watching them. It turns out it's because there's just a lot of bad movies being made. There's a lot of garbage being made. And also, it turns out if you see three movies every Saturday and you eat a big old popcorn and drink a Coke, <laughs> you gain weight. Um, I used to be skinny and then I started doing a movie review show and I got fat. So uh, it was a lot of fun to do. Um, it, 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 interestingly enough, it, it, it made me wish when, when I finally decided to leave Cheshire TV and my wife and I left Keen, we talked about going straight to LA and me trying to, you know, work in film and uh, we decided not to do that because we wanted to do other stuff first. We didn't want to tie ourselves down to one location. We wanted to travel and see things. And um, but yeah, doing that show made me wish I was doing like you know narrative filmmaking. Um, so you but, could do it right. You see all this yeah, junk. There was so much crap being made that I wanted to make better stuff. I mean, I don't know. You know, you guys are all in film school, so. Um, you guys, I'm guessing, want to be filmmakers. You want to be storytellers. And I think that's spectacular. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, that, that any of you should not do that. Um, but I am saying pay attention to what's happening around you because, um, you know, one of you might actually be a, a, an Academy Award winning editor and not know it yet. Um, one of you might be, uh, you know, uh, one of you might decide uh, one of the happiest people I have ever met is a locations manager in Charleston, South Carolina. You know, this guy, uh, what he does with his time is he manages, there's a TV show called Mr. Mercedes being produced down there. And he's the locations manager for that among other stuff. And he just loves doing that. And, you know, he started off you know, being a wedding photographer. So 
you know, like, uh, like I said, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think of things that I want to make sure I say that I don't forget. Cause when this is over, I'm not going to be able to call Tom and say, get them all back, get them all back. <laughs> um, <clears throat> obviously you cannot compare your beginning to somebody else's highlight reel. I mean, you know, like, uh, you're at the very, very beginning and, and it never, when you look like none of the stuff that I ever did in the moment I was doing it looked or felt like anything special, you know, um, it, which is weird because I will say that riding backwards on a horse felt weird. Um, and certainly almost falling out of an airplane. I thought that was probably something that mattered, but every single time I've ever, you know, stepped out onto that, that stage, you know, I, I, that sense of excitement has never gone away, whether it's some dorky little thing in Keene, New Hampshire for an audience of a few hundred or a few thousand to, you know, something that's being, you know, globally simulcast for Victoria's Secret, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's equally exciting because it's all show business in one way or another. <laughs> and Tom, I'm sure has told you that the second word in that is business and that it's not, you know, it's that it's a business and it is, but I tend to, I tend to still pretend that it's just for fun. I just ignore the money part. And I'll tell you that that's a, another good piece of advice. Um, <laughs> do what makes you happy. The money will take care of itself every single time. I have never, ever starved to death. I have never, ever been poor. I've been broke, but I've never been poor. Um, because there's always somebody willing to pay you to do something. And, uh, um, Boy, I would also say, is Spielberg still a thing? Do people still care what he does? Sure. You know, because sometimes when I talk to people and I mention a name, they give me this weird look like they've never heard of who I'm talking about. <laughs> so um, I would tell you that uh, a, a piece of advice that I would give you is do not try to be the next Steven Spielberg. Try to be the first Colleen or the first Megan or whatever the rest of your names are. That job is already taken. There's already a Steven Spielberg. There's already a Bob Zemeckis. There's already a Bill Shatner, you know, um, be you. And uh, that is what I have always done. And I have absolutely no regrets. You know, like I, 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 I would, I would not say that I would not change anything, you know, um, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't change anything. <laughs> Here you go. Other questions, Amy? Were you gonna jump in before? Oh, Colleen, sorry. Yeah, I have a question. When you were talking, oh, I'm just curious. When you're talking about like the plane and the horse, um, <laughs> so um, that kind of like sparked my interest a little bit because like I've actually um, done a little bit of like equestrian horse riding before. So I've been on a horse. How exactly did that work? Like, were you like one hand was behind you holding onto the, like onto like the stirrup and like your feet were just in there. Like how exactly were you not falling off the back of the horse? Or I'm just curious about like the plane, like talk more about the plane. Like what size was it? And, like, <laughs> actual, like doing that. Cause like that is just, to me that's kind of just as interesting as like the kind of shots that you're doing to see how that works in like reality okay so uh the specifics of the horse was the horse was a very well-trained horse um i used to, until i had a diving accident and and caused an injury to my back that makes me not able to do a lot of falling down i used to ride quite a lot western and um i uh I volunteered at a place that did like trail rides, you know, people would come in and pay money to ride a horse. And uh, for those of us who, you know, that's a lot of nose to tail, very slow walking through the woods, safe. Does it, you know, people imagine they're going to be out there cowboying and what they really do is. Um, so uh, at the end of those work days, um, when the customers were gone, those of us who volunteered and worked there, got to go out and just run wild. So these were really, really good horses. And um, I was able to ride on the back of that horse at a, at a, at a fast walk, not quite a trot, um, certainly not a canter or a gallop. Uh, but um, I did not hold on to anything because operating a steady cam is a two hand job. 
So I was seated in the saddle backwards. I did not have my feet in the stirrups. I did not have anything in my hands and I was simply not falling off the horse. As ridiculous as that sounds, <laughs> all I did was roll with the horse and uh, focus all of my attention on making sure that the shot stayed up in frame because um, I did not believe that, I believed that the longer I did it, the greater my chances of coming off the horse. So my focus was on getting the shot not the first time because that's almost impossible to ever do but as few takes as possible um the thing with the the airplane it was a cessna um it was an overwing which means that the wing is above you not below you and um there are a couple of angles that you can get if you've ever if anybody's ever been in like a two-seater cessna there's no air between you and the other person you're like you know cramped in there and any there's it's very 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 snug um, and uh, the windows sort of open like this. They don't go up and down, they open out. And in some of them, they open all the way up and you can strap them to the wing so that you're just you know, leaning out into space. And it's very, very difficult to get footage from that kind of an aircraft unless it's tipped over because you can't really shoot down and you can't shoot out without getting the wing. And this is back in the early nineties when, you know, cameras were bigger and heavier and um and i just you know the guy who was flying kept saying are you good and i'm like no i need you know tip it more tip it more tip it more till he was basically you know on on the wing meaning i was hanging out the window as much of my upper body as i could and thinking over and over and over and over again god i hope this seatbelt doesn't fail because if it does, I just right out the window. Um, and that was pretty stupid. I shouldn't have done that. But I would do it again in a heartbeat because there are some shots you can only get. Um, you know, I'm a diver, as Tom is. And I've, I've done a lot of Caribbean diving and I love wreck diving. And, uh, you know, I, I have a problem when, when I'm diving that I lose track of how deep I am and how much oxygen I have. And so I always have a buddy who sips oxygen so that when I come up and I'm running out of air, I can always have some of his. And I've got some beautiful footage um, that, again, as a diver, you're not supposed to break the rules. But sometimes if you think, well, that eel, I've got 30 seconds before I have to start heading up. And I just know that eel is going to come back because he's been doing the same thing over and over and over. And I, I don't want to call this whole thing a day without getting that shot of the eel poking his head out of the porthole and then pulling back again. And I just need 30 more seconds. And so when your dive buddy is tapping on his tank with a metal hook to get your attention and you're like, go away, go away, go away, you know? And so I got that footage and that, that is my approach. I mean, there's a part of me that realizes that those, the father in me, the father of their three daughters realizes that some of those things are stupid and dangerous and all that. But then I am also the person who says, well, if you hold on to the back of my jeans, I can lean over the edge of this cliff. And if, if you feel like you're not heavy enough to anchor me, if we get two people to hold on to you, you know, that's why, that's why, uh, anyway. So that, does that answer your question? I mean, that's, that's the nature. That's how I approach what I do. And uh, I'm not suggesting that everybody do that. Uh, but if someone comes to you and, and asks you to do something, if your heart starts to beat a little faster, that's a good thing. You know, that means you're stretching your horizons and you're taking a risk. And I think that Tom will agree with this. And I think that other professionals will agree that people who are older and have more experience, they know that you're, they know that you're going outside your comfort zone. And that brings its own level of respect. That all by itself is an accomplishment. You know, even if you don't knock the thing out of the park, your willingness to take a chance that isn't you being greedy, you know, it's for the good of the production that counts for a lot. I will always hire people that have guts, you know, over somebody that is skilled because you can get skill anywhere. Courage is harder to come by. Um. Tom, is it okay yep. if I just um, throw in like a, a comment? Sure. sure. Um, so one of the reasons why I was curious about the plane that you're talking about, and 
It's so cool that you mentioned that type of plane because um, when I was a kid, I was actually part of a program called Young Eagles of America. And I was able to co-pilot up in the air uh, that type of plane that you were talking about. Cool. So when you were saying- So you know how tight they are. Yeah, no, I know exactly. <laughs> this When you're describing, I'm like, yeah, no, I've been in that before. That Those things are tiny and just- Oh, they're they're kind of like little tin cans you're in. Mm-hmm. There's not that oh, much. Yeah. yeah. But it's awesome. Definitely. Other questions, folks. Jump in. Michael, Curtis, haven't heard from any of you if you have questions. Amy? You um what aspect of production do you think that you've enjoyed most so far? <laughs> well, Um, I would have to say that the excitement and electricity of about to, um, you know, uh, even, even a small shoot has a moment where everything has been unpacked, you know, I I don't know what, just before I talk any further, I want to ask a question to Tom. What what is the level of, 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 what have these guys done? Have they shot stuff? Like, have they set up lights and cameras? Okay. Yeah, so most of them. Okay, okay. So, so you know, if you're using a dolly, you got to lay out the track, and you got to, you know, level out the. Tr- there, there's all that that getting ready, the setup. Um, but then there's that moment when you actually start shooting, um, and in in a live event, there's that moment between you know when 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 the audience is 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 in the facility, you know, when the show is about to start, or if you're doing live television when you're watching the clock, and that goddamn second hand is relentlessly marching towards the top of the 12 and you know that no matter what happens whether you're ready or not you know seven o'clock is going to happen you know and you have to be ready camera one at seven o'clock on the dot so i would say that the 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 you know the drug um the 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 the, the thing that makes us all junkies for me it's that it's that that moment where you're about to start and it can all blow up in your face or it can all go perfectly. And sorry, I am looking at Tom, not the person who asked me the question. Where'd she go? There she is. Um, uh, I, I am a junkie for that moment uh, that, that take a deep breath that if you've ever bungee jumped or jumped out of an airplane, that moment where you can change your mind and then you don't. Um, The, old gray man in me likes to sit in the dark room and edit. <laughs> um, I love to shoot, but shooting is hard. Shooting is so hard. It's so hard to get it right. It's so hard for me anyway to translate the ridiculous fantasy in my in my little boy's head into the cold, hard reality of the world where actors are terrible and the lights are terrible and all the gear is crap. You know, I mean, and the budget sucks and the weather sucks and everything sucks. But sitting in a room, manipulating footage, you know, um, one of my exercises that when I worked with uh, at Cheshire TV, I worked with kids at the career center who were high school students. And I would give them a five minute mini movie and say, cut this into a 60 second PSA. And they would just stare at me and go, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't do that. And I'm like, sure you can, you know, ask any filmmaker if he can cut his beautiful masterpiece into a two hour piece of garbage. Yes, you can. Um, I, that's what I love to do. I love to edit. So I hope that answers your question. Like the, the drug that I slam right into my arm is the moment of action. And the, uh, the thing that brings me peace and helps me sleep at night is editing. Other questions. We've got like maybe five minutes left. It goes by fast folks. Other questions for Lee? Thought I saw somebody. I have one. Yep, Curtis. Um, what did you feel like you liked the most um, out of dealing with live TV, specifically like sports events or concerts or something? Wow. Well, that's a really good question um, because I know exactly what it was. Uh, whether I was a camera operator, because sometimes I was a camera operator, sometimes I was a lighting guy. Um, mostly I directed uh, technical directing. And depending on the project, you know, you can have a director who doesn't touch a piece of equipment. And then you can also have a director who actually, you know, pushes the buttons. If any of you are familiar with 
how television works. It's basically a selector, you know, camera one, camera two, camera three, camera four, camera five, as many cameras as you have. You're watching lots of monitors um, and you're, you know, calling, you're talking to camera operators, giving them instructions and you're, you're deciding second by second. You're, you're living 10 seconds in the future and making decisions right now um, for what people see in their houses. And the idea that regardless of the size of your audience, that every single person who's watching is watching what you did in real time. Um, that's pretty, that's pretty powerful drug all by itself. The idea that you are deciding what other people think, because even if it's a sporting event, there is a tremendous amount of editorial power in what you decide to show people. If you're doing a political debate and you show the guy listening instead of the guy talking, that's controlling what the viewer sees and thinks. Um, this is certainly way in ancient history, but a lot of people believe that John Kennedy was elected because he looked better on television than Nixon, you know? And, and if you go back and look at that film, it's pretty amazing that Nixon was ever elected to anything, but, you know, because the guy comes across like a, a Batman villain on television, but um, yeah, there, it's a, it's a, it's a, I love that that level of power and I'm a nice guy. So I would never use it for anything nefarious, but like, it's pretty cool that you can cut away from something, you know, uh, I, I like that idea. It's almost like a weird sense of time travel because what I used to tell students that I was teaching how to direct live events is if you're watching it, you're not making it, making it happens in the future everything that happens in live television, the decision has to be made before it happens. And sometimes it's a question of saying camera three, no four. And you know, that's fast. I mean, you can literally make a decision. There's 29 frames in a second and every single thing that happens is your fault. So you can take credit for it or you can take blame for it, but it's all your fault. Um, but yeah, that's what I liked about live television. Um, sports suck because you're not in any kind of control of what happens. Like the team is doing it. You're just trying to keep up. Um, but but like, like live music is a blast because if you're familiar with the content, you know what's coming up next. You know, um, a plays are a lot of fun because, you know, if you're at the rehearsals and you have a script, you, you know what's going to happen. And uh, it's, it's, it's fun to play God, I guess. Good. I think I can make a T-shirt out of that. Michael, it's you, fun to you play have, God. <laughs> yeah. Did you have a question or are you just stretching? Anybody else? We've got an hour. I've got a little after eight. Okay. No other questions, Lee. Any final words? You've entertained us and given us lots of good oh, information God. on the different no. on venues that are very. What I appreciate most is again your willingness to come on and talk to us about um, a related but but also different kind of venue and opportunity uh, for these folks. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I I I, I would say that uh, that that. Most of my professional experience is not in the arena where these guys are, are are talking about making their living, but it would be really cool if I somehow were to be able to talk to you guys five years from now, because half of you will be astonished at how different things went from you expected them to be. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, you know, I, it just that's just how the world works. But I would definitely say, you know, try to remember these sound bites. You cannot compare your rehearsal to somebody else's highlight reel. You cannot compare your attempt to somebody else's uh, achievement. It just, it's a horrible thing to do to yourself. Um, you are going to live probably 30% longer than you think you will. If anybody had said to me when I was 20, that, you know, I would be 52 having this conversation, I would have said, no, I'm not gonna live past 45. I hang out of airplanes, that's stupid and dangerous. And the reality is that I've had seven careers in my life. And um, every time you think you're done, something new comes along. I mean, I'm 52 and I'm trying to figure out if this year or next year, I want to go out to Hollywood and see if they'll let me play, you know? Um, and and uh, four weeks ago, I would have said that that was not an option for me, but in reality it is. So um, that's kind of cool. You know, um, I don't, I, all my kids are grown up. I can just go, I can go do something that I could have done when I was 20 and didn't because no one told me at 20 that you could make a living and not be an Oscar winning director. And that's probably the thing that if you walk away from this, 
you can absolutely make a comfortable and even good living just being a person who works for a living in this business. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to win awards. I've won a couple of awards. No one cares. You know, none of my kids ate that at dinner. Mm. You know, they, they want to eat food that you buy with money. So, yeah, I would say that that's the thing. Um, whatever your motivation is, there's no reason you cannot work in this business for the rest of your life and be happy and content. Because, you know, there is literally no other business like this one. That's what I'll tell you. There you go. I swear to God, there is no business like this business. I'm not going to say the thing. Okay, I was, I was going to go there maybe, but <laughs> great. Anybody <laughs> else closing it down? I would then like to thank uh, my longtime friend Lee Perkins for sitting in with us for an hour and talking to all of you. I'd like to thank those of you who had joined us to uh, watch and listen. Certainly want to thank uh, Misty Kennedy and Mark Gempler for all of their help all semester in putting these interviews together. Uh, you can, uh, in a week or so maybe, give me some time, you can review this with Lee Perkins and any of our other guests that we've had uh, on the Keene State website. I would like to uh, wish everybody happy holidays and thank my class and wish you all the best of luck as you go out and put all these skills to use. Uh, everybody have a, a good end of the year, and maybe we'll see you next year. Take care.